I want to talk today about the global need for palliative care, how we better understand the extent of that need and what we do when we've understood it. There's no doubt that around the world we're facing a, a growing tide of, of demand and requirement for improved palliative and end-of-life care. At the moment about 56 million people die in the world every year, something like a million people every week. And we know that that figure is going to go up quite significantly in the coming decades. It's a little bit difficult to predict exactly by how much, but we think that by the middle of the century there could be something like 90 million deaths occurring in the world every year. And much of that growth is going to take place, not where we live in the global north, in the advanced and rich world, but in the low and middle income countries of the world. So it's a terrific challenge that we're faced by uh, as a global society in meeting end-of-life care needs in an appropriate way in the face of this growing number of people dying. A number that's uh, increasing as the world's population grows, but also as the world's population ages. And this is telling us something as well about the model of end-of-life care that we need to be thinking about, where more and more people who could benefit from it will have lived for uh, many decades and perhaps uh, endured particular levels of suffering and morbidity in the final years of their life. A trajectory very significantly different uh, from the cancer trajectory which first influenced thinking about hospice and palliative care. So a huge need in front of us. What do we know about how we've been responding? For a few years now, along with other colleagues, I've been trying to map the global development of palliative care, and this is the, the current picture that we have. The green on the map is the key colour to look at uh, today. Those are the 22 countries around the world where we think there is a relatively advanced level of palliative care provision where palliative care is integrated into health policies, where there's drug avail availability and training, where there's research, where there are services that are at least oriented towards meeting population need. These are uh, a small a number of countries and many, many others are behind the curve in terms of their development. It was for that reason that we were really encouraged last year when the World Health Assembly produced a first and groundbreaking resolution calling on all governments of the world to integrate plans for palliative and end-of-life care uh, into their wider health policies. And uh, in the interim period, a great deal of work has been going on uh, to drive forward that resolution and to enable many of the countries that currently have very limited palliative care provision uh, to become uh, more organised uh, in their approach to uh, this type of health and social care and to support development with policies and investment and expertise. It's appropriate then that as we're thinking about the production of a new strategic framework for action for palliative and end-of-life care in Scotland, that we do so uh, in the knowledge of the World Health Assembly resolution and in the spirit of that resolution, which seeks to bring uh, good quality care at the end of life to all who may benefit from it, regardless of their age, their diagnosis, uh, or where they live. Here in Scotland, we face some particular challenges. Uh, at the moment, about 50,000 people die in our country every year. But the population of Scotland is growing, and we think it could increase by something like a million people during the course of this century. And that will bring with it uh, an increased number of people who die each year not least as the Scottish population itself, like in many other parts of the world, uh, experiences this phenomenon of population-based ageing, which brings a higher proportion of people uh, into the population at the higher age ranges. So there could be something like 60,000 people uh, dying in Scotland uh, towards the closing decades uh, of this century. This really brings to mind the question of how many people can benefit from palliative care. Should it be something we think of as happening for everyone who dies? Or are there specific groups of people who would be most likely to benefit? I was very impressed by this uh, review paper produced recently by 
Irene Higginson's group, where for England they attempted to uh, answer that question, building on earlier studies, but looking in particular at people who died in England between January 2006 and December 2008. Their estimates were, I thought, quite staggering. For many years the WHO had talked about 60% of people would benefit from palliative care when they die, but uh, now we have a figure which is much higher and the Higginson team estimate that somewhere between 70 and 80% of people in rich countries uh, would benefit uh, from palliative care at the end of life. So if we took this figure, and I'm inclined to go to the higher end of it, 82%, um, and applied it in Scotland today, we would then be able to say that 40,000 people in the country uh, who die each year would benefit from palliative care of some kind. The big challenge then is how do we identify those people uh, and then respond appropriately. I want to look at two settings in which we know something about this question of identification in, in the primary care setting and in the hospital. And this is a very interesting study produced recently by Scott Murray and his group where they looked at the numbers of people on the GP palliative care register. These registers were a very, very good innovation, an intervention that came out of the gold standards framework uh, and which encouraged uh, primary care teams to name and, and, and address the needs of people who they think uh, would benefit from palliative care. What the study which took place in the Lothians found was that of all the people who died over a given period from cancer, 60% were on the palliative care register, a high figure. And there was some evidence that the cancer patients on the register also uh, were successful in accessing specialist palliative care services. But when they looked at the people who died who had a primary diagnosis for a non-cancer condition, such as COPD or stroke or dementia, they found that only 20% were on the palliative care register. So only 20% of those pa patients were being identified as having palliative care needs. And what was also striking about that group is that the length of time between uh, their diagnosis and their ultimate uh, death was very much longer than for those with cancer. So we know something about how we can respond in primary care to identifying patients who could benefit from palliative care, but we see this huge gulf between uh, the benefits that flow to those with a diagnosis of cancer when compared to those with uh, other conditions. So we were interested in widening the lens a little further, and in this study, which we published last year, we were able to look at almost 11,000 patients who were hospitalised in Scotland in 25 major uh, general and teaching hospitals on a single night, the 31st of March 2010. We were then able to connect those hospital records to the death registration records and from that we were able to work out the proportion of people in hospital that night who had died uh, one year later. I was again quite surprised by that figure and I think many others were. The paper was very widely discussed at the time of its publication. Almost 29% of patients in hospital that night in Scotland had died one year later. But perhaps more striking still was the figure of those who died on the index admission, on the admission that we recorded on the 31st of March 2010. 9.3% of hospital patients recorded that day died on that admission. So from that we can generalise to say that walking into any hospital in Scotland today almost 10% of the patients who are there as inpatients will die before they leave the hospital. So the question we begin to ask is, how do we identify these people? Are they all on the palliative care radar? Are their needs and concerns and those of their families being adequately met? So a study of this kind very important in advocating for the needs of uh, palliative care provision within the hospital. So our view was that the acute hospital uh, was that indeed a, a very, very fruitful uh, area to focus on uh, the identification uh, of patients who, and families who might benefit from palliative care. 
Now that's easy to do with the retrospectoscope. How do we do it prospectively? Much more challenging as a clinical question. And again, Scott Murray's group have been looking at this and produced a very good systematic review a couple of years ago where they looked at a whole range of tools that have been developed around the world which might enable clinicians to identify patients who would benefit from palliative care and might potentially be in the final period of life. Um, they narrowed it down to four distinct measures which they deemed to be particularly robust and pleased to say one of these is the one developed by Scott and, and, and Kirsty Boyd and colleagues. Um, the SPICT, which has been used fairly extensively now uh, in, in some settings in Scotland. And it, it's an important tool in being able to give some guidance to clinicians uh, in their thinking about the prospective identification of patients who might then be referred to or offered uh, palliative care services. And there are quite a lot of others in, in this space. Perhaps the one that's become very well known is the surprise question which is advocated uh, by the um, gold standards framework. Would you be surprised if the person in front of you uh, was to die in the next six or 12 months? How do we go about looking at these issues more systematically in order to identify patients who would benefit from palliative care on a prospective basis? We know that the need is great. We know that the potential to benefit from palliative care is very significant. But at the moment, there's a mismatch between what we know and what we can do and those who actually receive those benefits and whose lives are uh, improved at uh, the very end of life uh, by the techniques and interventions that we call palliative care. But I also wanted to just remind ourselves that some of the smallest things that we do can also make a difference. Palliative care has many facets to it and some of them are not particularly technical. Uh, or difficult to think about and to enact. So two examples that spring to mind that cropped up towards the end of last year was uh, first of all the lady in the car park at the hospital in Middlesex who was helped by somebody to put money in the meter when she'd run out of the appropriate coins and enabled to get to the bedside of her dying father more quickly and be with him uh, as he died. Um, went on the internet to thank the, the person who'd helped her. And there was another one of the lady in the hospital in Wigan who was taken out to the car park in her hospital bed where she was able to say a very fond farewell to her beloved horse. I regard these as aspects of palliative care. They're not the territory of the specialist, but they're part of the culture of palliative care that we would like to foster, not only within the healthcare system, but within society as a whole. Thank you very much.